The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. When you join me... I can promise you an experience in suspense that can arise from many sources. Sometimes it is natural conflict, and at others the supernatural. We delve into the strange and the unusual. That is the shadowy world we explore, a world of minds and souls slightly askew. What we're about to hear is an adaptation of a story written by Algernon Blackwood about a man shell-shocked in the First World War. A not uncommon experience, but dreadful for the victim. His name is Terry O'Reilly. Captain O'Reilly. Oh, oh forgive me, officer. Oh, sorry. I, I, I didn't see you. This fog. Say, didn't we meet before? You were lost and, and some woman came around? Yeah, the fog was so thick that... Officer, Say, you, you, you all right? Say, maybe you're the man we've been looking for. Uh, Captain O'Reilly? Yeah. Yes. The police want me? Our mystery story, In the Fog, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Gordon Gould. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and x -Lax. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Shell shock is a psychoneurotic condition like hysteria. The stress of warfare can affect some men to the point where they become disoriented. They cannot tell what is real and what is unreal. They are treated by psychotherapy in a sanitarium until their minds are healed and they're able to return to life outside their safe and protected world. Slowly but surely, Captain O'Reilly dreamed less and less of the horrors he had seen, as he explains. I cracked up. I won't frighten you with the last battle when they came at us in our trenches. But the carnage was awful. Only a handful of us were left. I became a screaming idiot. And I was shipped home to a sanitarium near Cambridge. And a Dr. Henry. Now, uh, you think you're up to it, Captain? I, I think so. If you begin to feel any uncertainty, just go to a policeman and have him telephone me. Okay. You made good progress. All of us are pleased. You just think about the present and the past will recede. Phantoms exist only in the mind. They're up to you to control. I'm trying to, Dr. Henry. Now, your uh, friends in Boston, what's their name? Collard? Yes, Jeff and May. I wrote down their telephone number. Here it is. Ah, oh, good. I won't need it, I'm sure. Now, when you reach their house, it... Oh, it's on Beacon Hill. Mm. Oh, nice. Well, after you arrive, will you telephone me? Sure. Jeff's a buddy of mine. He got shot up pretty bad. It was when I saw him mowed down that I... But there he is, he and his wife. Doing well, I'd say, with that Beacon Hill address. Hmm? <laughs> now, your visit is a big step forward to you. Are you going by subway? Yes, from Harvard Square. Well, it's a short and pleasant ride. Enjoy yourself. I see you dressed for rain. That's wise. Well, it's predicted. It's hot, and the cold front is coming in from Maine. We'll get rain. Oh, maybe fog. I can do without fog. It it reminds me of gas drifting through the barbed wire toward our trenches. I left Dr. Henry. He and his staff had been wonderful to me. I wore my hat and raincoat, and I had the feeling that everyone was watching me. You know the feeling, like you're an intruder. Well, nothing happened. In the subway, I read the car cards, and then I got off and climbed upstairs to the street. Fog. 
thick as sheep's wool. I didn't know where to turn. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, officer. I, I can't see a thing. Oh, that's all right. Me neither. It rolled in about half an hour ago. Where am I? Uh, Tremont Street. I, I wouldn't move around very much. Most cars are to stand still, but there's always some nut who tries to drive. You wouldn't see you, and you're hit. No, I'm not moving. But I'm expected at my friend. Go and there, and... wait. If they got windows, they can see you'd be stuck. So they're on Beacon Hill. Uh-huh. Uh, across the public gardens in that sea of fog. No. You stick around a while. The fog will lift. Well, I can make it. Well, suit yourself. I, I, I just have to reach my friend. But wait a few minutes. You wander around through the park. You could stumble into the lake. Uh, are you all right? Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. You look kind of worked up. I, I, I was in the war, and Hello? the fog... Hello? Uh. Oh, help me. Help me. Oh, oh, oh officer. Officer. Oh, you, you have to help oh, no. me. What is it, Liz? I, I'm lost. Well, so am I. So oh. is this man here. Now, no one can find oh. his way in this thick fog. No, 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 but I said I'd be there, and he'll be waiting. Well, my advice is to stay put. No, no, I, no, I, I have to get to Morley Street on Beacon Hill. Well, that's where I'm going, too. Oh, then let's find it, please. Well, I warn you, lady, you go groping around in oh. this mess, and you could be hurt. I'll go with you. Oh, well, remember, I warned you. I hope I don't see you in the morgue. Hold oh. my hand. Yes. Tight. Yes, sir. Come on, now. Oh, oh, you're very kind. That's all right. I don't know the hill except it's above the garden. Oh, if I could only see. Yeah, it's unreal. What a phantom world. I, I hate it. So do I. Hold on. Uh, what's your name? Oh, uh, well, well that's unimportant. I, I, oh, I, I don't mean to be rude, but we'll, we'll, we'll never see each other again. Uh, Even in the fog, I can see how beautiful you are. Oh, well... Thank you. Holding your hand does me good. You're real. Oh, I should think so. I mean, I'm Captain O'Reilly, Army. Shipped out for shell shock. Oh. Well, are you... Uh, should you be out? I mean, isn't there a, a sanitary... No, I'm fine. What did you mean, I'm, I'm real? Not an illusion. That's what I suffer from. Not knowing what's real and what isn't. Now you know... Sure. Oh. It's slow going, but if we stick to the path, we'll be all right. Y your doctor said you could come into Boston alone? Sure. Dr. Henry. Hey, you're not afraid of me, are you? Oh, no. We're never dangerous, except maybe to ourselves. Like you reach for something you see, and it isn't there. That's why it's good to hold your hand. And don't be nervous. We'll find your house. Oh, but will I be in time? Inching along seemed like it took hours instead of 20 minutes. We went uphill, and the path ended, and there was a sidewalk and a curb. You couldn't see the narrow Georgian houses across the street. They were just shadows behind the white fog, like dark cloth under thin white. And here and there I saw pinpoints of yellow lights. Oh, uh, Morley Street, this way, to the right. Hold on. Oh, no, no, I, I can find my way now. I'll see you to your door. No, please don't. There's no need. But I'm going there myself. My friends, uh, the college, you may know them, they live on Morley. Oh, you'll, you'll find them. I hope so. What I thought was, if you don't mind, I'd telephone them and tell Jeff that... Oh, no. No, I, I, I can't let you do that. Uh, the, the telephone service has been cut off. Oh? Uh, I, I, well, I'm leaving Boston tomorrow. Uh, we are, that is. Oh. And, and the house is, is, uh, closed. My number is 141. You can head me in the right direction. Oh, of course. I'm 99. Oh, uh, there it is. Uh, oh, thank heaven. Oh, I'm so late. Oh, please be there. The woman broke away from me and ran through the open iron mail gate. I hurried after her. She entered the house through an open door, and that struck me as peculiar. I followed. Inside, I found myself in a dark hallway. I could hear her steps as she ran upstairs, and I called, Hello? Please go away. Please. I'm coming up. The door was wide open, and you don't know who's in the house. Wait for me. 
Uh, I'm nervous, Jeff. I, I, you'd think your friend Terry would have telephoned. Well, if he could, but he doesn't know Boston. I hope he didn't panic. He could have. But Dr. Henry says that he, he thinks the captain's ready to rejoin society. Oh, May, you'll like him. Except for Terry O'Reilly, I'd be dead. Uh, well, maybe we'd better telephone Dr. Henry and the police. No, let's give it a few more minutes. The fog seems to be lifting a little. I don't like to think of him wandering around out there lost. Well, everyone out there is lost, darling. Nothing moves in fog this heavy, and that's that's really bad for Terry. You know, there's something spooky about fog. Oh. Even a normal person sees things in it. Ghosts, figures of the imagination. Well, I- I've got a funny feeling about your army, buddy. All right. Fog or no fog, he ought to have been here by now. He's over an hour late. Well, Jeff. the number's on the desk by the phone. It's Dr. Henry's. I'm going out on the stoop. Maybe I'll see him stumbling along. Dr. Henry speaking. It's Mrs. Collard, Doctor. It's about Captain O'Reilly. He's an hour late, and I'm very... That's disturbing. The problem is the fog. The fog? Boston is socked in. Oh, well, then that relieves me. He must be waiting for it to lift. It's raining here in Cambridge. When the fog lifts, he'll turn up. But it's been an hour, Doctor. Now, don't you worry, Mrs. Collard. The captain knows what to do if he becomes confused. He has my number... And I've told him not to hesitate to speak to a policeman. You just sit tight. But don't you think we should notify the police? Well, yes, maybe that is a good idea. Tell you what, I'll do that and I'll come in. Oh, you don't need to do that. No, no, that's all right. Captain's a special patient of mine. I'll be in as soon as I can get to your house. You know, this experience could be critical for him. He's well recovered, but being lost could terrify him. And send him back into his world of phantoms again. It was very dark in the hallway. I felt along the wall and entered a parlor. There was a milky kind of light coming through the high windows. And I made out a candlestick. I was conscious of my heart beating hard. Not from effort, but from the eerie house. I struck a match and lit the candlestick and started upstairs. Hello up there. Are you all right? Holy Toledo. Where are you? Answer me. I'm coming up. When the woman screamed, I froze. I knew something awful had happened. I took the stairs two at a time, the candle flickering in front of me. There were several closed doors in the hallway. I tried the one nearest the street. I opened it. The room was lived in. I went toward a bed. And then... Murdered. Good Lord. Stabbed through the heart. Coincidence? It is frowned upon by many, but it is a fact of life. For want of a nail, the shoe is lost. For want of a shoe, the horse is lost. For want of a horse, the rider is lost. What else is that except coincidence? Who is responsible for the want of a nail? How was the doctor to know that when Captain O'Reilly emerged from the subway in Boston, that he would walk into a thick fog? Coincidence? When I return with Act Two, we'll find out where coincidence next led Captain O'Reilly. Coincidence is remarkable because of the lack of apparent connection between a group of events. That's how it seems. And why not? You meet someone you haven't seen for years. You may renew the relationship with good or bad results. And all because of an accidental meeting. When you look back on what followed, how can you explain it? An unexpected meeting. A coincidence. Well, Captain O'Reilly met a stranger. A woman as lost as he. When he followed her upstairs... He found her in a bedroom, murdered. To say I was shocked isn't strong enough. Almost without realizing it, I removed my hat. The dead woman was no illusion. This was real. Selfishly, I knew that this was good for me. 
I could distinguish between the real and the unreal. That gave me enough confidence to leave, and I left fast, running down the stairs. Then I heard a door closing. For a moment, I hesitated. Then I went outside into the fog. Uh, hello there. Huh? Oh, hello. <laughs> Don't be afraid. I'm a physician, Dr. Sprague. Oh? Is uh, something the matter? Can I be of help? No, no. I. Uh, well, I, I'm lost. It's uh, a little more than that, isn't it? You really are a doctor? Oh, yes, I live close by. Why don't you come with me until you calm down and get control of yourself? I'm late for my friends. Five minutes won't make any difference. Your name? O'Reilly. Captain O'Reilly. I, well, I, I could telephone from your house, couldn't I? Of course. You've uh, recently been discharged from service, Captain. Uh, yes. Shell shock? You can tell that. Oh, shrewd guess. You're distraught and you're perspiring. Well, I'm almost cured. I'm going to be okay. Yes, I'm sure of it. Thanks. So is Dr. Henry. Oh, yes, the uh, doctor with the sanitarium in Cambridge, of course. You'll be worried about me. So will my friends. Well, the telephone. Yes, yes, that's a, a good idea. You're very considerate, Dr. Sprague. By the way, how did you get here to the hill? Well, my friends live on Morley Street, and I... I walked through the public garden. From Tremont Street? Hmm. How could you see? I couldn't. We uh, we held on to each other and we managed. I don't know how. We? Some woman. This is her house. I, I saw her to the door. You didn't follow her in? Uh, she just flew in and up the stairs. I called. You see, the front gate and the door were open and I was afraid for her. Quite an experience, Captain. Yeah. First the fog, and then this, uh, this woman. Uh, who, uh, who was she, by the way? I don't know. Well, she was frantic. She was meeting someone, and she was afraid she would be too late. Ah, poor thing. Well, come with me. All right. You, uh, you didn't follow the woman into the house. Well, I... I asked because you said that the gate... And the door were open. The gate is still open, but the front door, Captain. But the front door is now closed. Well, he's been seen. I'm relieved. A policeman spoke with him when he came out of the subway on Tremont. Terry seemed to be all right. And then some woman came along and they headed into the public gardens toward the hill. A woman? Now, that's what the policeman said. A stranger. Now, she was lost, too, and uh, was acting pretty wild. You looked around? Yeah. yeah. The fog isn't that bad now. It's begun to drizzle. I walked around the block calling his name. Well, now, what do we do now? Nothing. The police are on the lookout for him, and we know that Terry is somewhere in the neighborhood. That's funny about this woman. Well, what's funny about her? <laughs> She's not imaginary. The cops saw her, and they saw them set out together. The doctor saying the door was closed. That bothered me. I knew I'd been in the woman's house. I didn't know what to do. The right thing was to notify the police. But would they believe I hadn't murdered the woman? We reached Dr. Sprague's house in a few minutes. He led me into a handsome study. Now, you want to telephone your friends, or may I do that for you? Have you have you the number? Yeah, I wrote it down. Here it is. Oh, thank you. Uh, operator, give me 1961, please. Uh, you can just relax. Well, it's mighty nice of you to take me in. Oh, I'm glad to be of help. Yes, Jeff Collard speaking. Oh, this is Dr. Sprague. Captain O'Reilly is with me. Oh, is he all right? Oh, perfectly. I'll send him on his way in five minutes. Thank you. I'm at 141 Morley. And uh, he really is all right? Yes. I met him on the street and noticed he was upset, so I brought him here to relax. He'll be along shortly. Where are you, Doctor? I, I can come for him. Well, there's no need to do that. Well, I'd like to, if you don't mind. Uh, your address? 99 Morley. Oh, for heaven's sake, that's only a block away. I'll be right along. And thank you, Doctor. Now, oh, you'll feel relieved. Yes. 
I know they've been worried. So Dr. Henry allowed you to come into Boston? Yes. Jeff Collard visited me several times at the sanitarium, and last week he invited me to his house for dinner. Dr. Henry approved. It all worked well until I stepped into that fog. And you were afraid that you might retreat into your, well, how shall I put it, your other world? You know about shell shock. Quite a good deal. You, uh, you experienced a dreadful shock, didn't you? Pardon me? Something about that house and the strange woman. Oh, why don't you tell me about it? In confidence, of course. I'm a doctor. Keeping it bottled up could be bad for you. What about the open gate and the open door and the strange woman, Captain? I, I told him everything. How I had bumped into the cop and the woman coming up. The stumbling walk through the public garden right up to the house and into it and into that bedroom and the woman stabbed to death. He listened intently. Extraordinary. It was horrible. And she was so beautiful. I can smell her perfume now. Poor woman. Yes. How odd. Worse than odd. And I don't know what to do about it. Oh, there's nothing to do about it. But the police... Well, you didn't murder the woman, did you, Captain? Good Lord, no. Then you'll be wise to forget about it. She'll be found, I imagine, and somebody will be suspected and hopefully caught. When I said odd, I meant odd in a coincidental sense. Oh? How's that? You have wisely unburdened yourself to me, so I'll do the same for you. I have a story that's very similar to yours. I'd like to hear it. I had a friend who was a professor at the college. Unlike most professors, he was quite wealthy, and he lived here on Beacon Hill. When war was declared, he... he enlisted. He must have felt strongly about it. Oh, he didn't. But uh, to go on, this friend had a... had a young and beautiful wife. They were devoted. He loved her very deeply. I loved that way before I was called up. Ah, you're married. No. I was overseas too long. She married someone else. And that hurt. Not as bad as a man can be hurt by an unfaithful wife, Captain. Is that what happened? My friend closed his house up on the hill. His wife took smaller quarters. He'd been in France for six months when he learned what was going on back home. She took up with someone else? She was young. She was beautiful. She was alive. But you knew her, Doctor. How could you allow her to take up with another man? It was I who wrote to my friend about what I... I suspected. Did he divorce her? No, he got leave to return for a few weeks, and he... He murdered her. Good Lord. And the other man? What happened to him? My friend waited in his old house where his wife and the other man used to meet. The man never showed up for their rendezvous. Too bad. Wasn't it? And she had left the front door open for him. Like... Like... Exactly. What did you say the woman said as she ran into the house? Uh, something like, I can't be late. I can't. And I can't miss him. She was afraid maybe he'd been there and left. That's the impression I got. And your friend said the front door was open? That's what he told me. The... The only difference between the stories is that... that I walked in not as the woman's lover. No. As a stranger. Did you bring him back, Jeff? No. No, I, I, I didn't find him. But Dr. Sprague gave you his address, and it's only down the block. Well, I went to 99. It was closed and dark from top to bottom. That's peculiar. Yeah, isn't it? I, I don't understand it at all. You tried the bell. Oh, sure, no luck. Then the next door neighbor came out, Mrs. Lawrence. I, I know her slightly. She said the house had been closed and the professor enlisted and that his wife had moved away. I asked if she knew a Dr. Sprague. She said she never heard of him. How funny. There's no doctor living in the block that she knows of. But why would Dr. Sprague tell you that... 
Oh, it beats me. And now we still don't know where Terry might be. Uh, something very strange is going on. I, I just sense it. But you said Dr. Sprague sounded perfectly normal. Well, he did. Well, maybe you'd better find that policeman and go back to 99. I'll come with you. No, 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 darling. You, you stay here. Don't forget that Dr. Henry's on his way in. Oh, I forgot. And who knows, Terry just might show up. Well, if he does, you'll take us out to dinner. Mine is ruined. Oh, it's a nightmare. Now, what if there isn't a Dr. Sprague? What? Why would he say he was if he wasn't? Well, Terry had to be with him. Or, or how would the man know us or our telephone number? Uh, and what's the matter with you, Jeff? I... You think Dr. Sprague's a, a a fictitious character? Well, maybe. But why? You, you think this could be a hoax? Who knows? The few minutes I spent with Dr. Sprague calmed me down. And confessing my discovery of the murdered woman did relieve my mind. Jeff and May knew where I was, so that worry was taken care of. I liked Sprague. And I was grateful he happened along when I ran out of that house. I said as much. And he said... Oh, coincidence, Captain. I like the fog. I often stroll around in it. Most people hate it. Well, I don't. It gives me a feeling of solitude. It encases me in myself. Shuts out the world. Well, I'd better be going along, Doctor. Yes, I suppose you should. Well, let me have to with your coat. Oh, My hat. What? Good Lord. I left my hat in that room. The police will find my hat and trace it to me. Why, is your name in it? No, it's just an ordinary felt hat, worn. Well, the police will know that someone murdered the woman and left the hat, but how could it be identified as yours? But I'll be missing a hat, and somebody will ask me about it. Right, then tomorrow in Cambridge, buy another. No, 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 wait a minute. I have a better idea. Take this one of mine. Oh, I couldn't Of course it. you can. I have several. Why not? You're very trusting, Dr. Sprague. How so? What if I did murder that woman? Oh, my dear boy, I'm convinced that you didn't. What motive could you have had? Yeah, none. I only saw her face for a few minutes, and she'd be the last person I'd harm. No, I wanted to help her. Someone else killed her. Someone who was hiding in that house. As I ran down the stairs, I heard a door shut on the second floor. So lucky you didn't meet up with him. I hadn't thought of that. You're right. I could have been stabbed the way she was. <laughs> Quite a story you're going to have for Dr. Henry. Mine and yours. Whatever happened to the man the wife was going to run away with? Ah, uh, my friend would like to know. I suppose that man did run away. Captain O'Reilly, I doubt if we'll meet again, but I wish you well. You know, this experience has been good for you. I think so, too. And uh, don't forget your hat. Uh, your hat. <laughs> Thanks. My alibi. For something I didn't do. I wish I knew who did. Who'd murder a beautiful woman like that? Someone she had deeply offended, Captain. All of us are two persons. That's a generalization, but I think it's true. We appear to each other as one kind of person. Then there's the inner person. A criminal does not have to look like what we think he should look like. Everyone is capable of committing a crime. For those that do, something snaps in the mind and triggers it. More when I return with Act Three. We have a victim of shell shock in the First World War. Nicely recovering and about ready to return to normal life. Then fog leads him into an experience that would terrify a sane person. The fog is frightening in itself, but then there's the stranger, the nameless, beautiful woman, and the discovery in her closed-down house that she's been murdered. Despite what Captain O'Reilly has told us, can we overlook him as the killer? He could have committed murder. thanked Dr. Sprague once more and put on my coat and his hat and stepped outside. It was raining now and I could see where I was. He had told me which way to turn to reach Jeff Collard's house. So I went through his iron rail gate and turned to my left. 
And coming toward me was the policeman. Well, well, we keep on meeting. You uh, are Captain O'Reilly, right? Yes. You've got everyone in town looking for you. Oh, I'm sorry. Dr. Henry called on the police, and your friend's been out in the street calling your name. I've caused a lot of trouble. <laughs> You're kind of special, Captain. Uh, Dr. Henry got a little worried that lost in the fog, you, you might have, well, lost your bearings. Well, I did. But a Dr. Sprague took me in, and... I'm okay now. Well, I'll walk you to your friends and tell her own headquarters from there. Is, is that all right? Of course. The uh, woman find your house? The... Oh, oh yes, I, I guess so. Why the guess? You were with her, weren't you? Well, through, through the public gardens. Then she thanked me and ran down the street. Oh, well, so she got home all right. I suppose so. I don't know. She was pretty tensed up. She, she was meeting someone. Uh, that's what she said. Uh, you remember what I told you over on Tremont? Now, if you'd listened to me and waited until the fog thinned out, you'd have saved yourself a lot of aggravation. Well, you're found, so we'll forget it. Oh, I, uh, I beg your pardon. Yes. Am I near 141? I can't quite make out the numbers. Dr. Henry? Why, uh, Yes. Oh, well, you must be Mrs. Collard. Yes, May Collard. Please come in. I I'm so glad you came. Oh, hasn't uh, Captain O'Reilly turned up? Uh, come in. No. No, he hasn't arrived. But but a Dr. Sprague said Terry belonged directly. Well, who is... Uh, who's Dr. Sprague? Oh, uh, just just leave your coat and hat here in the hall. Oh, uh, thank you, Miss Collard. Has, uh... Has something happened to the captain? No, not not that we know of. Uh, my husband's wandering the block trying to find him. Dr. Sprague telephoned and, and told Jeff that Terry was all right. Jeff said he'd walk down to 99, Sprague's address, and, and walk Terry home. And? The house is closed tight and dark as a tomb. Why, that's strange. Captain O'Reilly's somewhere in this block with a Dr. Sprague who isn't at the address he gave. Yes. Now, what do you make of that? We're, we're really terribly worried. Oh, well, now, don't be. I have full confidence in the captain. But wandering through that fog, it, it was like a covering of snow. You couldn't see five feet. Well, how do you know he's here on Beacon Hill? From this Dr. Sprague. Uh-huh. And maybe I'd better telephone the police. I told them to watch for him that I was coming into Boston. Maybe they have a report by now. It's hard to imagine walking through the public gardens if you can't see. <laughs> uh, yes. May I use your telephone? Oh, of course, back there in Jeff's study. Now, don't worry. Unless he's had an accident, I'm sure he's all right. Oh, Jeff, any luck? I can't find that policeman. Who's had an... Oh, Dr. Henry? Ah, uh, he's checking with the police. Well, I give up. Let him come to us. I, I don't know where else to look. Ah, Mr. Collard. Oh, hello, Dr. Henry. Uh, there's no news yet, but everyone's got his eye open for the captain. Oh, hey. Ah, uh, you must be May. Terry, thank goodness. Oh, buddy, hey, are we glad to see you. Come in, come in. My friend, Sergeant. Oh, Murray, do you mind if I use your telephone, Mr. Collard? Well, come with me. Where, where did you find this big hulk? Coming down to Mr. Sprague's house. So he exists, huh? Well, Captain? I apologize for causing all this trouble, Doctor. You've had quite a day, Captain. We'll wait until you're here. You seem to have borne up well. I think what happened to me today has got me cured. Fog can be terrifying. Not as terrifying as finding a woman murdered. Oh, no! What? You you found a... Hey, hey, what, 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 what's going on? You look shocked, May. I... It, it's just relief that Terry showed up. Sergeant O'Malley, thank you. Sure, sure. The alert's off, and I got a pat on the head from the chief. <laughs> Good night, folks, and Good night. Uh, keep O'Reilly indoors. Well, what's going on here? I'll sit down, and I'll tell you what happened to me. It was horrible. There was this beautiful woman. Ah, a spy story. And together, we found her house, right on your street. Yeah, sounds exciting. The front door was open, and she ran in. A few minutes later, I found her, dead. Good Lord. Well, uh, where, where'd she live? At number 99. Oh, th that's, isn't that where Dr. Sprague lives? Yeah, that, that's what he said. But 99's closed. 
No one lives there. The owner enlisted and the wife moved away. Uh, Terry, you... you... I was in that house. I found the woman on the second floor. Stabbed to death. I told them everything that had happened to me from the time that Dr. Henry had sent me on my way until I walked into their house a few minutes ago. It's incredible, Terry. Pretty weird, May. But it happened. Now what do I do? Yeah. The uh, body in the front room at 99 Morley. I have to report it to the police, Jeff. That's my duty. Don't you agree, Dr. Henry? Well, uh, yes, but uh, then come the complications. I know that, Doctor. Who's going to believe me? I found the woman murdered. I, a patient at your sanitarium. Captain, tell me about this Dr. Sprague. Mm, he was very nice. A very nice man. And you walked into him when you ran out of the house at 99, is that right? Yes, that's it. I was badly upset. He saw that and tried to calm me down. Jeff, Dr. Sprague couldn't have told you that he lived at 99. He just couldn't have. Yeah, you could be right. But no one lives there. But there's a body in there, old buddy. Sprague invited you to his house. You walked... And he led the way. It was close by. I guess we walked for a few minutes. Uh, you don't know where, of course. No. The fog wasn't too bad. And it had begun to drizzle. I just kind of blindly followed where he led. Uh-huh. And when you got to his house? It was dark. There wasn't even a light on the stoop. I followed him into a kind of study with books and shelves on the walls, a desk and some chairs. You told him your story, and he told you his. Why? Well, confession's good for the soul. But who's soul, Doctor? What's, uh, what's your point, May? Well, say that Dr. Sprague is a, a saint. He takes Terry in and, and hears his story and, and tells him almost the same one. Yeah. Why? That's what puzzles me. What if the story Dr. Sprague told was not about that friend of his, but about himself? What? This Dr. Sprague murdered the woman? Oh, that's impossible. Terry met him outside the house. I know that, but... Well, it's an idea. No, no, it's, it's, it's too fantastic, darling. You agree, Terry? I... I don't know. So much has happened, I'm pretty mixed up. I did meet him outside, May. But uh, could he have been in the house, Captain? I didn't see him. I didn't see anybody except the woman. It was very dark in the house. I don't think he exists. Now, wait a minute, Jeff. No, no, I, I, I know he exists, old buddy. I mean, I don't think he's Dr. Sprague. Uh, that man is, is somebody else. I, I, I know why he said he lived at 99 Morley. He, he wants the body found. But he said, he said that no one would ever know who murdered the woman. I, I was to forget it. He didn't suggest notifying the police. No, Doctor. Yeah, but giving me the address where there's a murdered woman is just about the same thing. He, he knew my curiosity would be aroused. Sergeant O'Malley will come forward about Terry wandering around like a ghost up and down Morley Street. You know, if May's right, if this Sprague is the murderer, he could frame you, Terry. Oh, I don't believe that for a second. He's a fine man. Captain, if you agree... I'll ask Sergeant O'Malley to step around and we'll enter that house at 99 Morley. All right. That's step one. If the woman can be identified, the police may find a clue to the person who stabbed her. The next hour was a week long. I told my story to Sergeant O'Malley, and he and Jeff and Dr. Henry entered the woman's house. They found the body all right. An ambulance took it to the morgue. Dr. Henry vouched for me, and the police thanked me for reporting the murder. I was placed in the doctor's custody until an investigation was made. O'Malley left the college house, and we sat down, pretty drained. You, uh, you feel better now, Terry? Yes, Jeff. I'm glad it's over with. Now you have nothing to worry about, Captain. It took courage to tell the truth. Well, he's never been short on that, Doctor. You didn't have to tell us any of this, Terry. Why did you? You've let yourself in for a lot of questioning. Well, it may sound funny, but I fell in love with that woman. 
Now, that may sound silly, I know, but she was beautiful. And she wore lovely perfume. And there's more to what happened tonight than I've told. Let me tell you two things. As I went up the stairs to the bedroom, I heard the door close. The woman or the murderer? Not the woman. She had screamed. So it was the murderer who closed the door. He did the same thing when I got to the bottom of the stairs and flew out. Well, why didn't you mention that to O'Malley? Because of something else. When I got to the street and bumped into Sprague, I didn't have my hat. I'd left it in the woman's bedroom. But, uh, there was no hat in the room when we were there. I left it there, Jeff. It, it couldn't just vanish. My gracious, if your hat had been found... Oh, you'd have been in for it, old buddy. That's hard evidence. But you were wearing a hat when you came in here, Captain. So I was. I told Sprague I'd left my hat on the woman's bed, and he said to forget it. And he offered me this one of his. Almost forced it on me. Just a moment. I'll show it to you. Here it is. So? Oh, it's uh, just an ordinary hat. And Sprague's hat was the same size as the one you left behind? Exactly the same size. And do you know why? Because this is my very own hat. You may have guessed, but I was sure of only one thing. Dr. Sprague, or whoever he was, did not intend to frame Captain O'Reilly. Weather is a factor in our behavior. Fog more so than other conditions because it's like a shroud. It deadens sound. It can lead you astray, often into the unexpected. And that is what we specialize in. The byways of life where a person by design or by accident may experience an adventure that will be unforgettable. I'll be back shortly. In the beginning, I spoke about coincidence. Is there such a thing? Or are certain meetings that seem to be accidents predetermined? Philosophers argue the subject to a draw, but I imagine that Captain O'Reilly, freed by the way and Sprague was never caught, often wonders about the awful night he was lost in the fog. Our cast included Gordon Gould, Martha Greenhouse, Ian Martin, and William Griffiths. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Why? Why wasn't I on this morning of all mornings? Why? Why? It's a miracle, darling. It's a miracle. Of course, it's a miracle. But that doesn't answer the question. Why was I saved? Five people are dead. The three in the plane, Mr. Fielding's, and a woman named Mrs. Jane Gray. Why was I saved? The people in the plane died because their aircraft underwent some malfunction. Mr. Fielding's and Mrs. Gray, they, they just happened to be there. I should have been there, too. Why wasn't I? Why was I saved? Because Dick Harrison called you at exactly 8 a.m., the split second you were about to leave. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> 